Thank you, John. What an example the Queen was. Now, I don't want to belabor the point, but one thing that struck me yesterday watching TV well, the commentator was saying that when she came up to be ordained as the queen, the first thing she did is she went to the altar, knelt down and prayed in the, in the sight of everyone. And that really struck me, thinking well, there was the foundation of her 70 years of service. What an example. And it's an example to us to remember who we represent if you know Jesus Christ as your personal saviour, we represent Almighty God through Christ, His Son. So this morning we're looking at Mark chapter 12, and we're going from verses 1 to 12, as you've just heard read. Today in the world that we're living in, the antagonism towards believers is escalating enormously. We're seeing the war where darkness is confronting light and the evil one, knowing that time is short, is throwing all he can at God's chosen ones. And the parable is like a portrait of the confrontation between the true light, Jesus, and the hostile dark enemy, in this case the Jewish leaders. And the Jewish leaders, the elders, the scribes, and the chief priests strongly influenced the people and were questioning Jesus' authority in the closing verses of chapter 12. And you've heard Lincoln over the last couple of weeks doing the, the end parts of chapter 11, and we saw this incredible antagonism towards Christ. It was blatantly hostile. So how did Jesus handle this confrontation? Well, he wisely told them a parable where he drew from issues in their everyday life and quoted from the Old Testament scripture that they would have known. The reason is so that they would understand what he was telling them. And he cleverly asked them what the solution to this parable should be. And to this they readily responded with an answer, only to realize that their answer trapped them. They hadn't trapped Jesus as they wanted, but quite the opposite. He trapped his opponents and they condemned themselves. And this parable depicts the journey of Israel through the ages and the principles and the lesson is for all of us to take heed of. The religious leaders were hounding Jesus. They were interrogating him. They were hostile in their intentions, wanting to trap him in his speech. And here Jesus goes on the offensive, remembering that he spoke in parables to reveal the secrets of the kingdom to the disciples and to conceal that message from those with hard hearts who rejected his message. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10, we see this. Isaiah 6 verse 9, God said, Go and tell this people, speaking through Isaiah, keep on hearing but do not understand, keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. So there he's speaking of those folk who would reject Christ's message. And this parable was a stinging indictment of them for rejecting God's Son and it provoked them to plot against him. When you look at verse 12 of the passage, of, of, of our passage this morning, they sought to lay hold of him. Now previously, he spoke in parables to hide the truth from his opponents. But now he tells a parable that reveals the truth 
to them and one they fully understand and it challenges their authority. This parable reflects the social situation of the first century Palestine, especially Galilee. Here we see where wealthy foreign landlords owned large land estates which they leased to tenant farmers who agreed to cultivate the land and care for the vineyards in the absence of the landlord. And this is a picture of God's kingdom being given to the nation of Israel. They were the privileged people. The rent agreed upon between them was a portion of the crop. And the landlord's agent was sent to the, the, the vineyard, uh, the, vineyard the vine dressers, at harvest time to collect the rent. And inevitably, tension arose between the landlords and the tenant vine dressers. So let us look with understanding spectacles at what Jesus said. When you take a look at verse 1, Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the, vine, for the wine vat, and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country. So here we see Jesus using familiar imagery from everyday life to illustrate a spiritual principle. And this parable draws its imagery from Isaiah's song, Song of the Vineyard, it's called. And I'm going to read it. It's, let me get to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5 and verses 1 through 7. This is the Song of the Vineyard. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? He'd done everything he could to plant a fruitful and a healthy vineyard. And he wants to know what more could he have done. It carries on in verse 4. Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? I've done everything I can, but it's bringing forth wild grapes. And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that rain, no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, weeping. That's the song of Isaiah. Simply explained, in this song which Isaiah sings for his well-beloved, the Lord uh, his well-beloved Lord, sorry, he rehearses the tender care of the Lord for his vineyard. God chose the best location, cultivated the land, planted the choicest vine, protected it, and prepared a wine press in hope of a good harvest. But instead of the expected good harvest, and the good harvest there would be obedience, thanksgiving, love, worship, and service, what did he find? Wild or foul smelling grape harvest that speaks of disobedience, rebellion, and idolatry. When you look at verses 3 through 6, it brings out the question why did he receive 
such poor returns. And then it tells us that the punishment impending was then announced. Removal of the hedge of protection, invasion by foreigners being laid waste, and it will return to briars and thorns and suffer drought. This looks forward to the coming captivity of Israel. When God looked for justice and righteousness from his own people, Israel and Judah, what did he get? He got murder and the cry of the downtrodden. So this is the imagery Jesus draws from. God planted a vineyard. It was a place of privilege then occupied by Israel. The hedge was the law of Moses which separated Israel from the Gentiles, preserving them as a distinct people of the Lord. And the pit beneath the winepress was to gather the juice of the pressed grapes. The watchtower was for shelter, for storage and security, showing the desire of the landlords to make this the choicest of vineyards. And it was then leased to tenant vine rep dressers representing Israel's religious leaders. And of course then he, trusting them, went off on a journey. When we look at verses 2 through 5, we find these words. Now at the right seasons he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again he sent them another servant and at, that, and, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another and him they killed. And many others were be beating some and killing some. So at harvest time, the absentee landlord who owned the vineyard sends his servants to collect the agreed upon portion of the crop. And this is repeated time and time again as the vine dressers, the tenant vine dressers, responded violently, treating the servants badly and abusing them even to death. And this action would have shocked the sensibilities of all those listening to Christ telling this parable. It would have shocked their sensibilities. Such wicked behavior was outrageous cruelty. Such wicked behavior was flagrant ingratitude and open defiance of the terms of the contract to which they had agreed. We'll pay you a portion of the crop. And finally, in a remarkably generous display of patience and mercy toward those murderous vine dressers, the absentee landlord who owned the vineyard made one more appeal to them for them to honor what was right. Verse 6. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to, to them last, saying, They will respect my son. So the owner of the vineyard took a very serious view of the situation. And instead of the landlord, as the hearers would have expected, sending an armed force backed up by the legal authorities to exact justice by executing those who had slaughtered his servants, he lastly sent his beloved son to procure his rightful portion. The word beloved here has the connotation of my son whom I love. When you look back in, in, in Mark chapter 1, we find these words. The father speaking. And the father says, a voice came from heaven. That was the father's voice. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So this landlord's son was beloved, was the one he loved. He reasoned that these tenant farmers would respect his son on the basis of his status and dignity. And this action would have seemed shocking, inexplicable, unacceptable, and even foolish to these vine dressers. 
What is he doing sending his son after all that we have done to his servants? The detail given by Jesus points to the history of Israel. In the Old Testament, the prophets of Israel are frequently designated as the servants of God and were sent to Israel seeking fellowship, holiness and love. But the people persecuted, wounded and even killed some of them. When we go back to Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, no, that's not Jeremiah. Where are you, Jeremiah? Ah, <laughs> oh, here we are. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verses 25 and 26, we are told, Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. And in Matthew 23, we find this. Matthew 23 and verses 31. Therefore, Jesus speaking here, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Verse 34, therefore indeed I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. So there's no doubt left in their minds that Israel persecuted the messengers of God sent to them. And in Palestine at that time, a piece of land could be possessed lawfully by whoever claimed it first, if it was ownerless and unclaimed by an heir within a certain time period. So these wicked vine dressers had that in mind. And then we come to verse 7 of our passage. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And these wicked vine dressers did not respect the son, and their greed led them to their outrageous action. They assumed that if they killed the son, they would acquire the vineyard. So now in the context of Mark's narrative, there is no doubt that the hearers here identified the son as Jesus in the parable as it is made clear in verse 10 when he says the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And their continual attack and antagonism against the Lord caused him to go on the offensive and they knew he had spoken the parable against them. And so further in verse 8 we are told and they took him, that's the son, and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. They killed him, they cast him out without a proper burial, discarding the son as carrion, which was a cause of great shame in the Mediterranean world. Now you know what carrion is, food for the vultures, food for the birds, food for... And in two other accounts of the same parable, that is the account of Matthew and Luke. The reverse order and the stress, the reverse order and they stress the rejection of the son's authority over the vineyard. Namely that he is cast out of the vineyard and then killed, bringing this into line with the historical circumstances of Jesus' death, where he died outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And in verse 9 we are told, Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dresses and give the vineyard to others. So Jesus draws out the meaning of this parable in asking the rhetorical question. What will the owner of the vineyard do? In Matthew 21 and verse 
41, we are told, they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably. This is the same account of this, the, wine, the vine dressers and the wicked vine dressers, that is. He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And we are told that these people answered the question themselves. They realized that Jesus had just led them to condemn themselves by taking the side of the, of the absentee landlord and condemning the vine dressers. Effectively, what they had done was to have passed sentence on themselves. This was a strong appeal for those who were plotting his death to consider the serious consequences of their actions. The rejection of the owner's son was really a rejection of the owner and their punishment will be capital. That is death and the vineyard will be let to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at the time of harvest. In a similar way, the Jewish leaders' rejection of Jesus, God's final messenger, was a rejection of God himself. And this inevitably brought God's judgment on Israel and would transfer Israel's privileges to others temporarily. These others may refer to the Gentiles and to the repentant remnant of Israel in the last days. When we go to um, Romans chapter 11, we see in verses 25 and 31 these two verses. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that the hardening in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And verse 31, even so, these also now have been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. So there we see that the privileged nation, Israel, their privileges had now passed, passed over to others. Look at verses 10 and 11 of our passage. Have you not read the scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. This quotation begins where the parable ends. God will not be thwarted and will overrule the rebellious human attempts to block his purposes in amazing ways. Jesus pointed the parable now to himself as the son and quoted Psalm 118, 22 and 23, which I've just read, which was a familiar text recognizing the Messiah. The kingdom would now be given to all those who called upon the name of Jesus. On examination, Jesus was trying to get the people and the leaders to realize what the elements of his story represented, what the elements of this parable represented. The vineyard owner represented God. We see that in Isaiah 5, 1 and 2. The vineyard is a picture of Israel, Isaiah 5, 7. And the wicked vine growers represent the Jewish leaders. They were responsible as stewards of God's people to care for Israel. And the journey that the landlord took represents Old Testament history, beginning with Abraham. And during that time, God gave Israel the law and ordained priests and scribes to teach the law to them so that they would obey God and worship Him correctly. And God expected to see spiritual fruit at harvest time. And instead of Israel being obedient and understanding the law, they planted, they produced worthless grapes, representing rebellion and unrighteousness, the very opposite of obedient worship and love for God. And the servants sent by the landlord represent the Old Testament prophets from Moses to John the Baptist. 
And they were sent by God to denounce Israel's sin and to call the nation to repentance and so produce a fruitful harvest for God's honor and glory. But they mistreated and rejected those that God sent, the preachers and the prophets. In his commentary, Alfred Plummer wrote these words. He said, The uniform hostility of kings, of priests, and people to the prophets is one of the most remarkable features in history of the Jews. The amount of hostility varied and it expressed itself in different ways. On the whole, increasing in intensity, but it was always there. Deeply as the Jews lamented the cessation of the prophets after the death of Malachi, they generally opposed them as long as they were granted to them till the gift was withdrawn. They seem to have had little pride in this exceptional grace shown to the nation and little appreciation of it or thankfulness for it, end quote. So Jesus, God's beloved son, was the final messenger in this parable. And we see that clearly in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We're told God who at various times and in different ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son, our Savior Jesus, whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. And just as the landlord's son was not a slave, but his son, so Jesus was not merely another prophet, but the son of God. And the vine dressers wanted control over the inheritance, and so they killed the owner's son and threw him out of the vineyard. It's a picture of the rejection by the religious leaders of our Savior, and they're handing him over to the Romans, who killed him outside of Jerusalem. So the, the son of the parable, representing Jesus, was changed to the stone which the builders rejected of the psalm quoted, alluding to Jesus' resurrection and exaltation. A slain son cannot be revived, but a rejected stone can be retrieved and used. And the stone here refers to Jesus, which the Jewish religious leaders and the tenant vine dressers or farmers rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That is, the head of the corner being the most important stone in the building. Speaking here of our Saviour, likened unto the capstone, shows a dramatic reversal of the builder's rejected stone to the highest exaltation, which could only be God's sovereign doing. This is remarkable. Though evil human actions will result in death of the Son, God will use this rejected stone to accomplish his marvelous plan of salvation. We'll look at Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Him, that is Jesus, being delivered by the carefully planned intention, that is the predetermined plan of God, and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken. By lawless hands have crucified and put to death. There it is in Acts. Not only was the apostate leader's stewardship over God's people taken away from them, but was granted to 12 ordinary despised Galileans. They weren't trained in rabbinic schools and from outside, and from, they were taken from outside the religious establishment. They became the recipients and stewards of the divine revelation, which they would in, be enabled to disseminate to the world. And when we look at Hebrews, uh, I mean, sorry, um, Ephesians. When we look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, we find this. The saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He was the capstone of the building, the most important stone. But the leaders in Israel looked upon Jesus, the stone here, as inadequate, as unacceptable, 
And so they rejected him. Jesus is speaking here of God's glorious kingdom, which the leaders were blinded to in their hardened hearts. And as far as they were concerned, he was not the cornerstone or the support of the whole building, the church. But in Matthew chapter 21, we find in verse 43 and 44 the following. Therefore I say to you, Jesus says, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on the stone will be broken and on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. He's telling here of the same account and explaining the consequences. This is a reiteration of severe, of severe judgment and a prophecy of the church. And God's new people would now be composed of both Jews and Gentiles born at Pentecost. The psalmist rejoiced in this day with, his, with this in mind. And I'll just go back to the Psalm 118. We've read verse 23. I'll just read it again. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Folks, <laughs> We are here and we can rejoice in this day. We can be truly glad in it. A day He has made, saved by our Saviour Christ. And verse 12, our last verse in the, script, in the passage says, They sought to lay hold of Him, but feared the multitude, for they knew He had spoken the parable against them, so they left Him and went away. So here we see the Sanhedrin representatives were seeking to arrest Jesus, realizing that he had addressed this parable against them. And they understood that the parable was directed toward them or with reference to them. But God's plan for him to die was still two days away. So they were not able to arrest him for fear of the people. And the point of Jesus' parable was understood by the crowd and they knew that their ancestors had persecuted and killed the prophets and that their leaders wanted to kill Jesus. But they were intent on still hearing him. And so these leaders, fearing the excitable uh, Passover crowd, these religious leaders did not dare harm Jesus. So wisely they left him and went away. Jesus is for all people, either the stone of judgment for those who reject him or the chief cornerstone of God's salvation kingdom for those who believe in him. And sadly, the religious leaders, having scorned the indicting, indicting judgment of the parable and rejected the chief cornerstone himself, were permanently condemned. Jesus was demonstrating in this parable the, immerse, the Im immense mercy that the Father shows and we who are saved are the recipients of that mercy. We're immersed in it. We also find the frightening wrath that God has for sin. It actually highlights the amazing grace and the forgiveness that God has shown us believers. That incredible mercy what do we sing this morning? His mercy is more. His mercy is more. So we are immersed in that mercy. And that's the mercy God has shown us, undeserved. Hence we're here this morning. And we can truly rejoice because this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord Jesus, for all the parables that you gave us, which means so much. And we thank you, Lord, that it is your word that changes our lives. It is your word that works within us through your precious Holy Spirit as we understand what you're saying to us. And as our conduct and our lives change because you are working with us to bring us to spiritual maturity. So we do thank you, Lord, and we do truly pray that we would be good examples of the very light that we have within us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.